Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Members of faculty, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted and honored to speak and share some thoughts with you as part of this wonderful event organized by AFG College with the University of Aberdeen on this occasion of Women's Day, which recognizes the progress that has been made by women everywhere and perhaps propose some recommendations for existing challenges. The extensive range of reforms to encourage women participation are underway throughout the world, offering a tremendous opportunity to learn from the cross-country experimentation and to build a knowledge base of lessons learned and strategies that can be transferred from one country to another. Indeed, the research shows that high-performing investments tend to have at least one female founder. This isn't surprising, given other research about the performance of diverse teams. Gender in entrepreneurship has recently garnered more and well-deserved deser attention. The number of women becoming entrepreneurs is increasing rapidly. Also investments in companies with at least one female founder outperform investments in all male teams. However, changing gender demographics needs orchestrated efforts from women everywhere. Today, women need to build alliances, create partnerships, and leverage financial capital to achieve sustained economic security and growth for women. It is important to study trends and offer recommendations. For example, women have their own culture in business practices and investment. They are more comfortable working in community, making decisions together, pooling resources, and leveraging their collective impact than men. They take a more relational approach to business, if you like, than their male counterparts. They prefer to learn from one another and network in community. Another important subject is the gender quota, and I have been an advocate for the introduction of gender quota in this country. Having uh, women on executive boards could help, put, uh, could help put women needs firmly on the agenda. From my experience, it's not only hard to get on executive boards, but also difficult to stay on them and prove that you, a woman, deserve the spot more than other men. Then there's the challenge of management development. It's a huge challenge. And it's shared internationally. Uh, generally, SMEs, led by women or men are not always managed as professionally as big firms. However, this is more obvious with women managers. SME business owners and managers generally do not spend much money on self-development and human resource training. In my opinion, government initiatives designed to encourage startups to boost the growth of SMEs must emphasize the importance of management development in business led by women. And as SMEs grow from their entrepreneurial phase to a professionally managed phase, it is essential for female entrepreneurs to adopt the concept of corporate governance. Let me share with you some facts about women in my part of the world. While you may think that female entrepreneurs in Qatar or in GCC region in general are focused on running small catering or handicraft businesses. The realities are that 30% of businesses run by women in the region are large scale and over 80% plan to expand. In Qatar, the field of education naturally was the doorway through which women entered into the labor market. Qatari women account for more than 50% of the total workforce of the Ministry of Education. The statistics of the Ministry of Education indicate that the number of Qatari female students 
in the state-owned schools has risen at greater rates compared to the number of male students. Yet, the percentage of Qatari women who participate in the country's labor force lags behind. This is a crucial topic in Qatari society today, both economically and culturally, and I'm sure it's replicated in other countries. However, the pandemic and the lockdown that came thereafter in Qatar presented a unique opportunity for women who were interested in entrepreneurship. Research shows that Qatari women are more likely than men to base their business ventures out of their homes and through online ventures. Precisely because of social and cultural reasons, along with some legal and regulatory reasons. The isolation brought uh, by the pandemic offered a catalyst for business that had the potential to be developed and executed remotely. And as a result, for female entrepreneurs, the pandemic helped them get their startups up and running. Women in Qatar are indeed witnessing great opportunities. However, they have less capital to fund them. The women entrepreneurs, in my opinion, who can capture the limited resources, have the potential to do well. Shortage and adversity are powerful stimuli for focusing the mind. To sum up, here are some recommendations. Firstly, we can start from here, create a network where women can connect with each other, especially in male-dominated fields. They can offer support to each other's businesses. And um, secondly, more opportunities for part-time work should be offered, especially systems where two women can share a full-time job in order to improve work and life balance. Lastly, men need to be educated about the importance of women participation in society, beginning with educating their children about the right of women to work. In conclusion, let me say that this collaboration in this setting is an amazing and wonderful way to share insight about women issues. With this note, I would like to wish you a pleasant day and a successful conference fraught with inspired and fruitful outcomes, and that the list of topics covered by our speakers will bring about great benefits to everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Excellency, Dr. Sheikha Aisha bin Fale Alfani the students and staff of AFG College with the University of Aberdeen, and the health educator from Qatar Cancer Society. I'm honored to be e-hosted by you during International Women's Day, this web event. I understand that this is part of the university's main campus events that will be live between March 8th and the 12th, to the 12th. I'm delighted that this year you have selected as the official campaign theme, hashtag, choose to challenge, to address gender bias, discrimination, and stereotypes in order to fight bias, broaden perceptions, improve situations, and celebrate women's achievements. Collectively, each one of us can help create an inclusive gender equal world. I will be focusing my remarks on women leaders in government, those who are serving in elected or appointed positions, or those who are officials in their governments. This is not to forget women serving in business, education, and other professions, but because I can best talk about what I have experienced as a woman in a career, diplomacy, traditionally dominated by men. Things are changing, but perhaps not fast enough, as we've seen women leaders taking on the challenge of COVID-19 in some ways better than their male counterparts. I'm thinking of the New Zealand Prime Minister, Jacinda Ardern, and the Icelandic Prime Minister, Kap, Kap Karen Jacobsdokter. Unfortunately, they are portrayed as the exception. Before I address the misperceptions and stereotypes that women leaders face, 
I wanted to first present you with some surprising facts and figures that I discovered while preparing my remarks. I wish this could be, by the way, a question and answer session, but since it's not, let's just pretend for a moment. How many countries have women serving as elected or appointed heads of state? Well, according to the Council on Foreign Relations, Women's Power Index, as of September 18, 2020, only 21 out of 193 recognized states have women heads. Bet you thought there were going to be more. Who was the first woman actually elected as prime minister? That was Sri Lankan Prime Minister Shuri Mogo Brandonayake in July 1960. I expect many of you thought it was Indira Gandhi. She was actually elected prime minister in India in 1966. Now, which countries have the most female parliamentarians and cabinet members? Well, 14 out of 193 countries have at least 50% women in the national cabinet. These would be ministerial positions and the like. And four out of 193 have at least 50% women in the national legislature. Rwanda stands out here, and so do many other African countries. How, how do Western countries rank? Well, France has only had one female prime minister, Edith Cresson. The UK has had two, Maggie Thatcher and Theresa May. Also, for the Scots in the audience, Scotland's first uh, minister, Nicola Sturgeon, is also the first female to hold that position. The US none, not a figure I'm proud of. While perhaps overshadowed by the election of the first US female vice president, Kamala Harris, in November 2020, people may not have uh, seen the news that Madova got its first president, female president, Maya Sandu, in November of 2020. Now let's look at what distinguishes women leaders. They are more likely to challenge established conventions and policy agendas. They are more likely to cross party line to find common ground. In Northern Ireland, Catholic and Protestant women's groups joined forces to establish a powerful political party that made progress along uh, cross religious divides during the Northern Ireland negotiations in the late 1990s. We can see this in the US Senate today, where yesterday, two brave female Republican senators voted to impeach former President Trump. Female lawmakers are also more likely to advocate for policies that support education and health. A good example of that is Dr. Sheikh Aisha. Women's inclusion at leadership tables promotes stability. I mentioned Rwanda before, in post-conflict Rwanda, where over 50% of parliamentarians are women, lawmakers have supported inclusive decision-making processes that promote reconciliation efforts at the local level. Let me contrast this to when I was ambassador to Ethiopia, which at the time was hosting the South Sudanese government peace talks. I witnessed women being excluded from the room. But we have to remember Women are not a homogeneous group, and not all female leaders will be cooperative, peaceful, or advocate for laws that strengthen gender equality. Being the first woman elected can be hard, requiring leadership to navigate, to navigate previously male-dominated structures. Now to the issue of why women leaders aren't receiving more votes of confidence. I turn to the Reykjavik Index for this which assessed attitudes toward female leadership in the group seven countries, Canada, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, the UK and the United States, as well as India, Kenya and Nigeria. Their survey of 20,000 adults provided some clues. Only 38% of people in Japan were comfortable with the idea of a female head of government. In Nigeria and Kenya, the percentages were higher at 62%. And in the G7, it was 78%, but still not a score of 100%. Even in Germany, with Angela Merkel's long and successful time as chancellor, only 41% of Germans felt comfortable with a woman being head of government. The problem 
the problem is unconscious gender bias. While most people, especially young people, consider themselves progressive and would not never admit to being biased, it's clearly there. When asked, many people incorrectly assume that women have higher, higher representation in government. I gave you those figures before. This may be because they look around and see women occupying half or more places now in higher education or dominating in certain professions such as teaching. When asked directly if men or women are better suited to leadership roles, people tend to deny their prejudice. When questions are masked, more negative views emerge regarding women in leadership. The 2016 presidential campaign of Hillary Clinton certainly reflected this. Women had even more misgivings than men that were surveyed. They were heard to say that she was too aggressive, ambitious, and authoritative. So it is not just men who hold these views and misperceptions. According to Dr. Alice Eagley, a psychologist at Northwestern University, the stereotype is that women don't have agency or aren't decisive and authoritative, and their voices aren't as loud, and, oh, by the way, they're kind of small, or they talk too much. We recently heard the remarks from the former Japanese prime minister who's had to actually resign because he said that women talk too much in meetings. He recently had to resign from his role heading the Olympic Committee. We find these types of these traits, positive traits of leadership, are traditionally associated with masculinity. Women find themselves between a rock and a hard place. Do they work with or against gender norms? This double standard, this double bind, also applies to other groups who may be criticized whether they adhere to or push against biases. You've probably heard that black women are stereotyped as being too abrasive and Asian women as being too timid. Well, there has been improvement. According again to Averly's and colleagues analysis of several decades of data on gender stereotypes between 1946 and 2018, the U.S. public considers women more competent. Well, thanks a lot. But beliefs about women's master, mastery, their agency, the ability to achieve goals, those haven't budged at all. One solution is to change the Im image of women's leadership roles and not focus on whether it's a man or a woman. Media and popular culture have an important role to play here. Highlighting Kamala Harris is great, but we need to avoid complacency around gender equality or the perception that the extraordinary, one extraordinary event is sufficient. Harvard Business Review in May 2018 published an interesting study assessing performance reviews in the U.S. military. The different words we use to describe male and female leaders by David Smith, Judith Rosenstein, and Margaret Nikoloff. They found that most people like to think of themselves as unbiased and objective in making employment decisions. The U.S. military was selected for the study because it has moved to remove and eliminate former gender segregation and discrimination. When the criteria is objective, grades, fitness scores, class standings, men and women tend to rank fairly evenly. However, the subjective evaluations provided a different story. Women were assigned significantly more negative attributes than men. Let's look at the words used to describe men and women's positive and negative attributes. Positive words for men include analytical, competent, dependable, level-headed, logical, and practical. Negative words included arrogant and irresponsible. There were far fewer positive words for women and many more negative. On the positive side, compassionate, enthusiastic, energetic, and organized versus the negative, inept, selfish, frivolous, passive, scattered, gossipy, excitable, vain, temperamental, and indecisive. Who would you want as a leader based on these attributes? That was a rhetorical question. If you focus on only two attributes, 
or a man analytical and a woman compassionate, even though both of these are positive, most people would choose to hire someone who was analytical over compassionate. The Harvard Review found it ironic that one of the leadership traits that people say they most appreciate and want in a leader actually is compassion, again, an attribute most associated with women. So why aren't these tra translating into more women leaders? It's one thing to describe an ideal leader, another to describe a real person's performance without being influenced by stereotypes about their gender or what a leader should be. We need to examine the words that we use. We need to communicate loudly and clearly that women are and can be real leaders, just like men. Maybe each has different leadership styles, but by opening up the space for both men and women to lead equally, we will be able to solve the significant challenges facing the world today, such as COVID-19, cancer, and climate change. Both require compassion and analytical skills. Thank you very much. Hello everyone, my name is Noor Hamad, a health educator at Qatar Cancer Society. I would like to welcome the students and staff of AFG College with the University of Aberdeen. On the occasion of the International Women's Day, I will be discussing the most common cancers among women in Qatar. According to Qatar Cancer Registry, the top five most common cancers in female are breast cancer, which is a malignant cancerous growth that begins in the tissues of the breast. It develops when abnormal cells starts to multiply out of control and form a tumor. The most common type of a breast cancer is ductal carcinoma, which begins in the lining of the milk ducts. The most common signs and symptoms of a breast cancer, persistent lump in the breast, Note that very small percentage of breast lumps are turned out to be cancer. It changes in the breast size or shape. A breast skin changes such as dimpling, hotness, redness, visible veins, or itching, nipple abnormal discharge, and retracted nipple. It can be prevented by maintaining a healthy weight, being physically active, avoiding smoking and drinking alcohol, Exclusive breastfeeding for at least six months reduces the risk of developing breast cancer. In addition, finding breast cancer early can prevent deaths from the disease. In Qatar, it is recommended to do regular checkups and regular screenings called mammogram test every three years for women aged 45 and above to look for early signs of breast cancer. Thyroid cancer. It occurs in the cells of the thyroid, a butterfly-shaped glands found in the front part of the neck. The most common signs and symptoms of thyroid cancer. A lump in the neck, sometimes growing quickly, swelling in the neck, pain in the front part of the neck, sometimes going up to the ears, hoarseness or other voice changes that do not go away, trouble in breathing, trouble swallowing, and constant cough that is not due to a cold. Thyroid cancer can be prevented by reducing exposure to high levels of radiation, early removal of a glands, and the familial cases of certain types of thyroid cancer, a healthy diet rich in iodine. To detect thyroid cancer early, it is recommended to seek a doctor in a regular manner. Also, your doctor might ask for a blood test to check the gland's function. Colorectal cancer it starts in the colon or rectum when the cells in the body start to grow out of control. The most common signs and symptoms of colorectal cancer a bleeding from the rectum, a blood in the stool, a change in the shape or the size of the stool, a cramping or abdominal pain, 
a feeling of discomfort or an urge to have a bowel movement when there is no need to have one, a new onset of constipation or diarrhea that lasts for more than a few days, unintended weight loss, weakness and fatigue. To detect this type of cancers at early stage, it is recommended to do early screening for both genders, starting from 50 years old and above. These types of screenings include fecal immunochemical test that detects small amounts of blood hidden in the stool and colonoscopy every 10 years. The screening includes fecal immunochemical test every two years in Qatar and colonoscopy every 10 years. Gynecological cancers includes cervical, ovarian, uterine, vaginal, and vulvar cancers. However, the most preventable type is the cervical cancer. The most common signs and symptoms of cervical cancer, abnormal vaginal discharges or bleeding, pelvic pain or back pain, pain during intercourse. To prevent cervical cancer, maintain a healthy lifestyle by exercising 20 to 30 minutes five times a week. Get pap smear test and HPV test because certain types of HPV can cause cervical cancer by 70%. Have HPV vaccination and try to avoid smoking. Cervical cancer often does not cause any signs or symptoms until it is advanced. However, it can be detected by doing pap smear test after marriage every three years for women aged 21 to 49 years old. Skin cancer, uncontrolled growth of abnormal cells in any layer of the skin and can be anywhere in your body. Early signs and symptoms of skin cancer, a sore that does not heal, change in sensation, itchiness, tenderness or pain, flat, firm, pale or yellow areas similar to a scar, small, pink or red, translucent, shiny, pearly bumps which might have blue, brown or black areas. Look for new moles and any changes in existing moles in size, shape or color. We at Qatar Cancer Society advise you to make healthy choices to reduce your risk of cancer. Live smoke free, be sun smart, have a healthy weight, eat well, sit less and move more.